So what is a home lab? Why should you have one? And how do you get started? That's what we're going to talk about in this video. So a really common question I always get from people is what is a home lab and why do you need one or why should you have one and if you've decided that you're going to get one how do you get started and that question or those three questions collectively actually can open up to a lot of different possibilities so in this video I'm hoping to basically help you get started with uh, getting a home lab and how to get started with kind of looking for parts and so on. But at the same time, I want this video series to kind of come out and actually be educational for different people. So in this series of videos, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over some of the very basics about home labs and servers and the equipment that surrounds it, as well as some of the terminology that you're probably gonna come across as well. So we're talking about cables and various other components that you may or may not have come across depending on your background. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Robert Meisen. Um, my YouTube channel is pretty new uh, and I don't have so many videos up here. Um, but my background and my current work, um, where I am right now, uh, for example, is in networking, servers, data centers, and in IT. Um, and I work with a much larger set. I do have a home lab. Um, some of you may have seen the videos. You can go up on the uh, link above and have a look at some of the videos of my current home lab. Uh, but also I actually have a large data center that I use at uh, education here in Javla, Sweden, where I teach students who are gonna go potentially work inside of a data center. The first question to ask is, what is a home lab? A home lab actually doesn't really have a really strict definition, but a home lab is really just a set of equipment that you can use at home to either learn or utilize to help your life at home. So this could be to add services that you might like, and it also could be uh, just to kind of tinker with and play with or to learn. Some people use home labs uh, to learn certifications from ComTA or Cisco and stuff like that. Some people use home labs uh, like myself for that purpose and also to provide services at home. But a home lab in itself uh, can have a lot of different configurations. Um, there's a really good um, Reddit group uh, that I'm gonna put in the link in the description below, which will just give you such a huge range of options of what a home lab can be. And it does vary from person to person. So that's a really good way to, to look at this is to kind of go, what is the home lab gonna be for you? why should you have a home lab? Um, even me, uh, who has access to a large data center, uh, is in terms of, uh, for a personal use anyway, um, and I use it for the education here, but it's quite large, right? So why do I have a home lab at home, but also have this lab here? And that actually is probably a lot of people who work in IT probably have access to equipment that they can use at work, but a home lab, um, also can be very useful at home even if you do have access to other equipment because why you should have a home lab is if you're interested in IT it's a really good way to play with stuff without breaking or anything so obviously if I were to ruin stuff here then it would create more work for myself but if you are interested in learning IT there's so much you can learn by having your own equipment uh, and playing with it and trying out things, resetting it, installing new things. So it's a really good way to learn. And it's a good way to kind of progress that journey going forward. If you are really interested in services for your home, there's so many that you can use to help you. You can have media servers to stream uh, your uh, different services. You can actually hook in multiple streaming services like Netflix and so on through a kind of portal to have like one unified interface. It's also a really good way to get all of your like, you know, legally acquired movies and TV shows and demonstrate them that way uh, so that you can play them on different devices around your home. Uh, but also things like uh, Pi-hole, really good project, really simple blocking ads across your network. So rather than installing ad blockers and so on, on every device, you could actually just have a network-wide uh, ad blocker. Uh, and it's a really good little project, um, of one of the kind of um, 101 home lab projects there, so to speak. 
Uh, so there's lots of little projects that you can do. You can run your own file servers and backup servers and stuff like that. So there's a lot of projects you can do. So there's a lot of reasons to have a home lab, even if you have access to lots of equipment. If you don't have access to lots of equipment, then having a home lab is your only way to have physical interaction with the equipment. Um, you can actually do some home lab stuff without a lot of physical equipment. But basically what you need to remember is that the more stuff you have access to, a lot more possibilities for you to play with, a lot more configurations, and you can have home labs within home labs, and you can have like a production environment and a test environment and a learning environment. So there's a lot of options there. So there's a lot of reasons to have a home lab. Again, the Reddit group is really, really awesome uh, for, for this type of uh, finding out what other people are doing. I've discovered multiple projects on there that are excellent, really excellent ideas that I never thought of before to uh, improve my own services at home so uh, and as a side note if you've got like a partner who isn't so hot on the idea of having this kind of massive thing at home you don't need to have a massive home lab you don't need a huge rack you don't need um, you know massive amounts of um, equipment to start with and it doesn't need to be noisy and if you can provide some benefits in the home like a media server file servers backup servers then actually you can end up with telling your um, your significant other hey this is going to be really good for our home and that's a really good thing um, it's a really good way to convince your significant other that this is going to be a good idea to get started with home labs there are varying different ways that you can get started if you don't have access to equipment if you don't have a lot of money spare to buy equipment even secondhand uh, and you don't work in a place where they have equipment that you can take home because it's out of its warranty or its end of life type of deal don't worry there are actually lots of options for you to start learning firstly you can use virtual uh, equipment you can use virtual uh, uh, kind of software to to do this so you can use stuff like VirtualBox to to run on your computer to install versions of Linux for example and different other services you can run it that way of course, it requires your computer to be on all the time, but uh, if you want them to be running at least. And another really good way to learn networking would be to use something like Cisco Packet Tracer. Really advanced, but a very easy piece of software to start learning. Um, basically, it creates virtual networking um, on a level that you will be very surprised at. It's, um, I've explained this to numbers of students before and to people before, and everyone is always quite surprised by Cisco Packet Tracer. It's very advanced and it's free, and they have like a 10 hour introduction course at the time of recording this video that you can start learning with it, and it's free, and all you have to do is sign up to it, and it doesn't cost anything. So it's a really good way to start networking, uh, to start learning how different devices speak to each other. So if you don't have equipment right now, and you cannot get equipment right now, don't worry there are options for you. So that's that's something to consider there. If you have a workplace that has an IT department, which most do these days, you can come across equipment that is out of warranty or out of its service life. Um, and normally in most cases, like here in Sweden, for example, uh, the, the, the shelf life, if you want to put it that way, of equipment is after about three years, the equipment becomes worthless. Um, and a lot of the time we end up with a lot of spare equipment. We've donated a lot of equipment to charities and other people like that. I have got some broken equipment here that I've fixed and taken home. Just to give you an example of the type of stuff uh, that I mean when it comes to getting stuff for free or for cheap or something like that. Um, over here, like I have uh, this Synology unit. This is an RS812 uh, four bay Synology um, NAS. Um, and it's quite old, uh, it's kind of slow but it was down in the basement and it wasn't working. I had to replace a couple of parts in it and now it works really good. Um, and uh, even though it's at this point probably 10 years old, if not more maybe, um, it works really good for the purposes that I need it for. Um, and below that I have a, an old um, computer. Uh, in there is just a, uh, my current server right now from recycled parts, basically old case, old motherboard, old processor, an i5, nothing uh, super awesome, 
and it works really good for Proxbox and it's working really good for me right now um, until I change it this summer. Um, I did have a consumer router at some point. I've changed it to this UDM Pro, uh, really solid like routers. Uh, they cost about $300 or something, uh, but definitely worth the money. But I did start with something smaller. Um, I'll see if I can find an image and put it up in the video whilst uh, we're doing this. But basically you don't need to start with anything too extreme. Uh, you start with something small and build your way up. Uh, and as you keep adding more, you'll kind of can do more experiments and more services and stuff like that. But this is just an example of what I'm using right now in my lab. If you do work in an environment, it can be worth asking your boss or your supervisor like, hey, I want to better myself. I want to do some learning with IT. There's some old equipment. Can I take it home and play with it? Even if it's for a few months or permanently, even better. But you can always find some pretty good uh, stuff that way. And stuff that was really good a few years ago um, is still perfectly fine today. You don't need the newest servers. You don't need the newest equipment. You just need something you can play with. Another option is eBay um, and places like eBay, Blocker in Sweden, uh, Tradera, um, Craigslist, stuff like that you can be surprised at how many good deals you can find on old equipment. Uh, most of these tend to be uh, done in kind of um, big uh, pallets or wholesale uh, by companies that maybe do an upgrade for a company and they end up with like, you know, 100 servers or desktops or whatever like that. That's good, but also you can find it from individuals as well. So, and you can find really good deals. You can uh, buy servers that are, you know, five to 10 years old, for example, that are perfectly fine, um, that run really well, that have multi-core processors. And because of the way that, at least for the last five, 10 years, that Intel specifically has been very big in this space, um, there's a lot of interchangeability between servers. If you can get your hands on like HP servers, for example, those are normally quite good because the, the parts are not super proprietary. Dell servers, quite popular. They tend to have more proprietary parts in them, but they are quite cheap. You can buy like old Dell servers for like $100 um, and they have like, you know, four, six or eight core processors in them. And they've got enough RAM slots for like four to eight RAMs. Uh, some of them come with dual processor slots. So you can do quite a lot with them and you don't need a lot of power to run a lot of services. So it's a really good way to get started. So if you have a couple of hundred dollars, you can be surprised at what you can get for that something else uh, to consider when buying old servers and old parts uh, or recycling from uh, old stuff that's from a school or from a workplace is to be honest most of the components are fine the processors will be fine the motherboard will be fine the PCI Express stuff will be fine the memory will be fine it's really just gonna be the power units uh, and the fans those two things are like the most uh, major things that tend to fail uh, so in most data centers, like the fans uh, that are inside will be the things that start to make noise, you'll replace those. The power units will be the things that wear down over time, um, as with all power units. So finding replacements for those is actually quite easy. Um, you don't even need to always use the um, official uh, parts for that because if you can find a fan that's the same size, a Noctua 201 for example, you can replace the server fan with that and as long as you do this, the fan config then it will still work. But basically um, you're never really going to be replacing the CPUs or motherboards or stuff like that. Those things will get a little bit harder if it's kind of proprietary like the Dell stuff. But most companies will give away this old stuff because uh, because the fans are gone or because the power unit is not working so it's easier for them to just get another one um, and then give away the old server so that's something you could always ask your company or school or workplace or whatever or if you look on eBay and you find them really cheap it's normally for these reasons to be honest so that's also something to keep in mind. Um, also um, corporate grade switches and routers they cost an astronomical amount when they're new I mean, we have switches in the lab here uh, that cost like 50,000 crowns, about, about $6,000 each, um, and which is just no way could uh, an individual person even warrant buying something like that, plus they're noisy as hell. It's also, um, you can buy like these secondhand uh, routers and switches, like the kind of commercial grade ones, and you can buy them on, on eBay for like a couple of hundred, like two, three, four hundred dollars for pretty decent models that work really well. And you'll be surprised at how many of them actually have uh, 10 gigabit networking in them uh, because uh, you could, they'll normally have DAC cables uh, or DAC ports, SFP plus ports and so on. And that's 10 gig networking. 
at least internally. Um, obviously, the limit of your network connection is going to be depending on your internet service provider, but internal networks, I mean, there's no reason why most people can't have an internal network of 10 gig these days. The prices of that has gone down a lot, so uh, definitely keep a lookout for that. But also, you can tend to find secondhand 10 gig network cards. So there's a lot of places you can look. I'm going to put a few links uh, below in the description. I hope that this was helpful. I've got a few videos I want to plan for this series where I'm going to talk about different cables, different things to look out for and kind of help you learn different things like that. Uh, short videos on uh, different cable types, what they're used for, how they work uh, and also um, basically like the things that you might come across when you're looking online like what does this um, acronym mean what does this terminology mean and things like that because uh, a lot of people who have been in this space for a while will talk about different cable types of different terminologies and if you haven't come across it it can be new and you want to make sure you understand it so I'm planning a set of videos that hopefully will be really helpful to all of you if you haven't seen any of the videos about the data center that I have here I'm going to put the link up in the description below so hopefully you can have a look at that um, and if you do like the video please press the like button and if you want to see more videos from me press subscribe and hit the bell icon uh, so you get notified when I post some more videos especially the videos in this series so I'll see you in the next video